Yar! Ahoy mateys and welcome to today's workshop Sailing on the Seas of Chi Hey, che Chaos? Chaos? Is that how you spell that? Oh, well, I know a lot more about chaos than just how to spell it and today I'm going to explain to you the properties of chaos a little bit about organizational behavior and how we can tie the two concepts together with the theories of team learning. Are you ready? Let's begin. The first thing that we should do is illustrate the concept of chaos. And for that, I knew there was a reason I didn't take down my summer fun pool. Look at these three footballs sitting in a pool. You can see that. Just a moment. They start off relatively close to each other. I'm setting them up right now. You can see that I'm going to line all these footballs up pretty much next to each other in this pool, right? Now, what would happen if I start kicking this pool? Introducing a little bit of chaos into the system. I'm kicking the pool, and you can see all those footballs, they start to go everywhere. They started close together, but will they always be close together? I'm not sure they seem close together now. Then what's going to happen over time as we wait it out in this crazy chaotic process? They may start to veer far apart. They may return to places that they already were. And they may end up going a little bit of everywhere. At the same time, hopefully that was it's a little hard to kick a pool while I'm recording a video, but you can kind of see some sort of structure emerge in all those little wavelets that were forming as I was kicking that pool. Okay, well that was a fun little experiment, but let's get a little more serious and let's talk about what chaos really is. And for that, luckily, we have Wikipedia. Alright, so here we are over on the chaos theory page on Wikipedia. And I'm going to tell you uh, the things that I just tried to illustrate by kicking that pool in the context of actual chaos theory. Okay, so here we are in the chaos theory website here, right? Chaotic dynamics, yeah. This is going to give me my answer that I'm looking for. Wait a minute. Although there's no universally accepted mathematical definition of chaos, ah! There is a common leaves definition that was originally formulated by a guy named Robert L. Devaney. Who's that? That guy sounds like fun. Here's Robert L. Devaney, actually likes to be called Bob, and I know this guy because I met him at Boston University. He has done so much research on chaos, and in addition to his reaching research and teaching in mathematics, you'll see that here on Wikipedia it even says that Devaney's mathematical activities have included organizing one-day immersion programs in mathematics for thousands of Boston area high school students. I may have told you in a previous video that I grew up in Boston and I had a really hard time as a teenager, but guess what? At some point when I was in high school, we went on a field trip to Boston University and I saw this man speak. I saw Bob and he introduced me to the Mandelbrot set. And that chance encounter with this wonderful person changed the course of my life forever. After that, I went to Boston University and I majored in mathematics, and I actually took Bob Devaney's course in Introduction to Chaotic Dynamical Systems, and that is where I learned the very definition that I introduced to you today. So thank you for that little aside. It's so important as we work in the lab to think about relationships, building relationships with others. How can we help each other and how can we learn from each other? We'll talk more about team learning later in the video. Back to the definition, here are three key concepts that I was trying to illustrate with that pool and that I'll also explain again um, in this context. Number one, sensitive to initial conditions. A dynamical system is chaotic if it exhibits what we call sensitive dependence on initial conditions. And for that, I was trying to illustrate with the pool the fact that although the football started close together, when the chaos ensues, they might start to veer apart. Now, that wasn't a precise mathematical chaotic system, 
But here is a precise mathematical chaotic system, the famous Lorenz equations. Um, originally formulated by Edward Lorenz, a meteorologist at MIT, while he was studying the weather, um, Dr. Lorenz noticed that if he re-ran his simulations with three different initial conditions that were very close together, you'll see them in blue and purple and red. Actually, you can't see them because they're so close together. But if you wait it out, they diverge. You see that? Now you can see the purple. Now you can see the blue. And they're different than the red. Just like the balls in the pool, they started together. They started traveling together. But eventually, they diverged apart. Even the tiniest, teeniest, littlest difference in initial conditions, when sufficiently iterated through a chaotic process, will eventually cause this type of divergence called the sensitive dependence on initial conditions. The second condition is called topological transitivity. Um, the easy way to say this is it's mixing. And the easiest way to explain it, again, is with this wonderful illustration here. Now you can see that in this chaotic process, at first, we have a ball of points in blue. And they're all pretty close together. What happens after we iterate the process? After only six iterations, you'll see that that ball of blue points turned into the purple cloud and onto the orange cloud. And now it's blasted out all over the place. Going back to the pool analogy, if I kept kicking that pool for long enough, all of those footballs would have eventually reached every place that's possible to reach in the pool over time. Everything gets everywhere. That's the topological transitivity or mixing property of a chaotic system. Third point, density of periodic orbits. So what this says to us is that chaotic systems contain a bunch of different periodic orbits, which is to say places where things repeat themselves. They come back around. There's all sorts of cycles, cycles of every length, cycles of every type, and they're everywhere mixed into that chaotic process. Fourth point, the existence of strange attractors. You may have heard of strange attractors before. Um, the most classical one is the, uh, Ed L the Lorenz attractor or the butterfly-shaped attractor that's gotten so much attention in popular media. Um, strange attractors are the eventual thing that a chaotic process settles down to. You may think that chaos is so all over the place that we'll never be able to figure out anything from it. Uh-uh. Just like the chaos game that I showed last time, an order emerges, a secret strange order, the order between, starts to show itself, and it's called a strange attractor. And here you'll see that strange attractors typically have a fractal structure. Just like when that um, Sierpinski triangle merged out of the chaos game, that thing had a fractal structure. Wow, there's so much cool stuff to know about chaos, but what does it have to do with all that other stuff? So let's go back to our PowerPoint and do a quick review and then move on to organizational behavior and then start to connect them. The properties of chaotic systems that I just went over, sensitive dependence, even small differences become huge over time. Transitivity, and this I made in the context of your team company work, is that every team and every individual in the team eventually experiences everything that there is to be experienced all the stages are experienced over time in different ways. Dense periodicity. To me, that tells me that my learning is going to be cyclic. I'm often going to return to places where I feel like I've already been. But it's not just returning and repeating yourself. It's just it's coming back around and there's always something new to be learned. Existence of strange attractors. That's the structure that emerges at the whole system level. And if we trust the process and stay with the process, eventually we will get to appreciate seeing ourselves as part of this emergent whole. Those are four properties of chaotic systems. Now let's think about four stages of organizational development. You may have heard these before. The four stages are forming, letting the games begin, storming, after we've started to form and get to know each other, now we start to speak and we have differences. Of course, we're a diverse team and sometimes those individual differences create a conflict or disorder, a chaotic system of storming. 
And if we're able to make it through the storm, we can reach the third stage called norming, in which the big picture emerges and we start to see ourselves as part of a whole united system. And if we're really lucky, we're going to make it to the fourth stage, which is called performing. That's when the system's working like a charm and we're learning as a team fully functional. Stronger together than we ever would have been apart. All right, so let's go over to this slide from our friends at Timi Academia. And Timi Academia, sorry, this is a Finnish word. Um, They've given us this wonderful illustration of Katzenbach and Smith's model of team's development curve. And on this curve, we can kind of see the efficiency of the team starting out strong, going into a dip, and eventually coming back and hopefully rising up to a level that we hadn't even achieved yet in the start. And we're going to match these up with the four stages of organizational behavior. In the forming stage, everything's growing great. Oh, nice to meet you. Oh, this team's great. We all are very enthusiastic and looking forward to what's to come. Well, guess what's to come? It happens to everybody. It's better to know about it so you can understand it when it happens to you too. The storming phase. And that's when the enthusiasm has started to wane a little bit and we're starting to see individual differences emerge and those new differences feel like conflict, they feel like confusion, and so our efficiency dips down into the stage that's called the fake team. That's the storming phase. But stick with it. Hold tight to the rules of dialogue and you'll be able to emerge back up in efficiency into the norming phase in which you become a functioning team. You're a real team and you learn how to work efficiently together. But wait, that's not all. Can we get even better than the real team? Well, not every team makes it, but it seems like about 10 to 15% of teams get into the performing stage where they become top performers and they're st super strong together, working synergistically. Um, all their strengths combined make them into this awesome whole thing, better than the sum of its parts. Okay, now it's time to put the two things together. So how can understanding chaos help us weather the storm as we go through the storming phase? Well, we just talked about sensitivity, meaning that even similar ideas quickly diverge from each other. They always cleave apart in that chaotic type of regime. You know what that says to me? Let's not get too, bo too bogged down in the details. Sometimes teams might spend a lot of time discussing and deciding on just a little detail. Well, chaos theory tells us that even two things that start very, very, very close together will eventually diverge apart. So why would we bother spending our time getting bogged down in the details? Let's just agree on something and move on. Let's keep that process moving because the iterative nature of the process is really what's going to allow us to push through the storm. You can see at the bottom there, I'm talking about when the storm clears, we're going to be able to see a shared mental model. This is our goal, is to get to what Peter Senge calls presencing. Next property that we learned about chaos is transitivity. That mixing property, the fact that everything is going to reach every place possible over time. And this reminds me of something that William Isaacs said in his book on dialogue in chapter 5 on respecting. He asks us to practice respecting by listening to each other from the vantage point that says, this too is in me. So when I hear someone voicing something that seems completely opposite of me, and I feel like disagreeing, I feel like that's going to hold me up, transitivity helps me to understand that as I travel my path, eventually I may get to a point where I'm in the same place that that person speaking is at. We are all part of the same united whole. The goal is to get to Senge's stage of presencing where we create that shared mental model and we see all of these seemingly opposing pieces as part of a greater whole. The property about periodicity tells us that learning is circular, not linear. So once again, you may return to where you've already been, but think of that in terms of circular learning and keep in mind that even when you feel like you're coming back to a place that you were, you're coming, you're circling back, and there's always something new to learn. You're not just returning to where you were, 
you're coming back to close to where you were, but there's something slightly different about it, and there's always going to be something new to learn. So don't get discouraged when you feel like you're coming back upon something. If we practice all those things, then we understand all those things. They will help us to create a shared mental model and see ourselves as part of a whole, and then we'll be in the state of presencing. Now, what does that have to do with chaos? Well, in that state of presencing, we've now achieved the norming phase, and we've become aware of coherence and unity. This ties in with the concept of a strange attractor, which you can see in the background there. That's an instance of uh, the basins of attraction, a strange attractor for um, a certain chaotic process. And um, what we really need to do is believe that a structure can emerge from chaos. And mathematics has discovered this and is now realizing this. This is new, but it is super true. So once we trust the process and we know that that structure is going to emerge, we can maintain our dedication to the dialogue and stick with it and iterate ourselves through so that we can see that emergent structure. Um, again, from Isaac's book on dialogue on chapter 7 on voicing, he talks about the voice of a group. And the voice of a group is a function of the emerging story amongst a group of people. So that's what we're trying to do is understand by voicing as individuals that we are all just a piece of this greater structure. And if you look carefully at the background, you're going to see there's five different colors. But on the edges, there's a mix where all five of the different colors show up at the boundaries between each of the things. So that's an emerging fractal structure. Hopefully by that point we will see different distinctions or disagreements or differences of opinions as just part of a larger we. So we're striving to hear the true voice of the group and see ourselves as little pieces of a bigger picture together. What's an example of this that we've already studied in the Changemaker Lab? That's the fractal structure of the shared vision Remember that um, in our team companies, we discussed our individual personal visions and together we formulated that shared vision. And you'll be creating a shared vision or a common why inside of your project teams as well. And that emergent structure has a self-similarity. It's going to have a fractal structure as strange attractors most often do. And self-similarity says that we are all contained in it and it is contained in all of us. So that's kind of like David Bohm talking about the holographic nature of a shared vision in which all of us combined are in every single piece of that shared vision. How are we going to get there? The function, the process, is dialogue. Dialogue is what allows us to iterate towards emergence. So remember to stick to the four tenets of dialogue so that we can get to this stage and see this greater structure emerge listening, respecting, suspending, and voicing, all part of that um, wonderful process of emergence. The fourth stage will be performing, but before we get to performing, let's just see one more little cool example of chaos, since it is so fun. Back to the browser for a moment. And here's another example of chaos from a YouTube channel called Make Anything. And this is something that somebody made. Oh, I really can't wait till I have the time to make this on my wall. And it's called a double pendulum. You may have heard of a pendulum before, right? It's just something that kind of swings like a hinge. It just swings on something. What if you took the tip of the pendulum and then you made another pendulum on top of that? So here's one pendulum. And then at the top of the pendulum, or the bottom of the pendulum, we just add another pendulum to that. That would be called the double pendulum. And guess what? That's enough to give us chaos. So here we see a double pendulum going. At first, wait, what the? And it's going, and it's just crazy. It's going everywhere. It's a pendulum on top of a pendulum. And that is truly a chaotic process. That looks super cool. You can see he's using this little glow pattern so that you can kind of see the trail of it. But I wonder what would happen if I actually trace the trail of that. And I saved it to see what would emerge if I saw the pattern as a whole over time. 
For that, we have this awesome picture by Super Potato of a long exposure of a double pendulum. So that's exactly the same double pendulum concept that we just saw in the video, but this person took a long exposure of it and saved the trace of what happens over time. What does that look like? To me, it looks like a brain. And I think that this is an awesome illustration of the concept of a shared mental model and shared vision, the things that we can create as we practice dialogue in team together, we can see this bigger picture that we are all a piece of. That's our shared brain. Cool. So now going back to the PowerPoint so that we can get to the final stage, how do we make it to performing? Not every team gets there, but we all want to achieve this. How can we achieve our best? Well, the answer is we're going to practice team learning. So here's an example from your team companies. You hopefully know your rental team leads by now. Guess what? The rental leads have been meeting each other as a team behind the scenes so that they can learn from each other. And now that your team company has elected leadership for the other team, for the other five leadership positions, I'm saying that one way for us to practice team learning and achieve that performing level of a team since we are a team of teams of teams would be to create what we call leadership groups or leadership teams the team leads can all get together we have five different team companies what could the five team leads learn together if they all met as a group and discussed what is the team lead role what are we learning in it how is it going same thing for the comm leads, communication leads. How's dialogue going in your team? What are you learning? What's working? What's not working? Get together and learn from each other and we will all become stronger for it. Same thing for the accounts or customer leads, the financial leads team, and the project leads team. We can form all sorts of teams and practice team learning together so that as a team of team of teams, we can surely make it to that performing stage. Hope you enjoyed this workshop. I'll see you next time.